Greetings, Nick from Sweetwater here. We're backstage with the one and only Richie Faulkner, and he's just shown me that I've been playing Firepower wrong. <laughs> Darn it, thanks for showing me up. But no one's seen me play it wrong, so it's all good. We're here to talk about his rig. We've just done some footage on stage that we will fly to with the digital magic we are in power of. But let's talk about his rig, but we're gonna start with this here, because this is the limited edition Richie Faulkner Flying V by Epiphone. So tell us all about this, my friend. Well, it is indeed. It's, uh, it's, it's based on a guitar that I've had for a few years now, ever since I joined Priest. And uh, I've been modding that and customizing it over the last seven years, uh, to the point where, uh, you know, I was speaking to Epiphone about doing a signature model, and that just seemed to be, you know, the, the, one. the one to go with. And uh, so they've, they've replicated everything. Perfectly. I mean, originally I had uh, EMG 81, 85, uh, and as the mods and the uh, customizing went on, I changed them to the 51, 60, 57, 66. Yeah. 57 bridge, 66 neck, correct? Exactly yeah. that. What made you choose those over 81, 85 I was, for tonal reasons? I, I was out in Japan uh, a few years back, and they had this old, uh, this old Flying V, and uh, it wasn't the original pickups in it, but they'd put original paths in. I think it was a, it's a 60s V, but they'd put earlier uh, pattern apply for pickups oh, in really? it. really? And uh, I just liked the way that they responded. It was kind of, it's hard to describe, you know what I mean? Uh, yeah. But they had like a honk and a cut and a, just a presence about them. Gotcha. And I uh, emailed the, the EMG guys and said, have you got anything like this? And they said, yeah, they, we might just have exactly what you're looking for. And at the time they were working on the 57 and the 66 combo. And they said, try these out. We think you might like them. So uh, we put them in, me and my tech, AD Vines, we put them in. Right. I didn't try them out, I just went on stage with them. And it was pretty immediate uh, that this was what I was looking for. It had that path quality. Well, but you, actually also... did, you walked out and did a gig with them? Yeah, in front of <laughs> you know, however many thousand people. But, but that's the, I've played EMG for years. Right. So they, I knew they weren't going to send me anything that was subpar. You know? It was just whether it worked or not, you know, um, stylistically and feel-wise and everything like that. And I knew pretty, pretty immediately within a few seconds that these were, this is exactly what I was looking for. And they've been in ever since, and they're, they're in all the guitars that I've got out with us, with the exception of a Les Paul that I've got, which has got the 81, 85, right. and one in the middle. It's a three pickup thing. Gotcha. Um, but yeah, they just had that characteristic I was looking for. And it was, always, it was to me, it's, it's about, I can give less thought to what it's going to sound like or how it's going to respond and more thought as to what I'm feeling and what I'm kind of expressing. Gotcha, gotcha. So um, it becomes more about that. Uh, and they were exactly what I was looking for. Um, it's, got the, it's got the Floyd Rose trim on there, the double scratch plate. Um, Which is cool. Yeah, I, I wanted a, a classic look. Uh, something that hadn't been done before, which is always tough, you know. You, the binding's you, nice as well. Binding's beautiful. Um, and it's bound on the neck and the headstock as yep. well. Um, double scratch plate was originally to start, I wear like cuffs with spikes right. and studs on it, and it was scratching away the paintwork. So uh, I just thought it looked classic, it was memorable, it set it apart, uh, and it served a function, it served a purpose as well by stopping the paint from being scratched gotcha. off. It's got one volume knob. It's a speed knob as well, isn't it? It is a speed knob. I've, I've just got used to speed knobs over the years in sweaty bars and clubs. You need right. as yeah, much yeah, grip yeah. as you yeah. can get, you know. Um, the input jack is on the top wing here which I always thought was a lot more streamlined when you put the strap around the back, instead of having the cable over. Yeah, I you know, agree, yeah, that makes sense. Just make, made complete sense. We've got the battery pack on the back so you can change the battery nice, of the Nice, and it's a no, no annoying screwdriver needed. No, you just open it, pop the battery Bang in there. It, perfect. It's got the ebony fretboard with the uh, block inlay markers. So I like the, the Falcons call too. The Falcons, uh, it was when I first joined the band, Rob, my name's Faulkner, yeah. and it came from uh, Falconer. Yeah. And so we, apparently, the, 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 my ancestors were Falconers for, you know, dignitaries and royalty and all that. So they kept Falcons, flew Falcons, trained Falcons. So Rob said, oh, he's got to be called the Falcon. <laughs> and it kind of started, and if Rob <laughs> Halford says it, you know, I mean, you There's know, no choice. So you have no choice. Exactly. So the Falcon logo went on there. I've got it on tour jackets and picks, and it, it was, made though. sense. We've got the Priest logo on the headstock with the Epiphone uh, logo on there. And the, the body's mahogany, right, as is the neck? Yep. Just the uh, ebony, f ebony fretboard? Ebony fretboard, exactly that. And the, the neck is also a satin finish as opposed to a gloss finish. Oh, nice. Yeah, we, on, the, on the original guitar uh, that I've had for years, uh, you can see the thumb ring I wear, yeah. and it carves off all the guitars I've had for a while, carves off the paint on the top of the neck. 
I was, looking, I was looking at your V on yeah. the stand, yeah, and it's, it looks really warm. Yeah. Right there. <laughs> and it does give a different feel. So when the master builder came down from Epiphone, we, we were trying, it was, it's a bit unsightly. No one wants the right. paint gone on their, on the guitar. So we were trying to find a way of recreating that feel on the neck without making it look like an old dog, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they, they suggested a satin neck and I tried it out and it was, it was perfect for what I wanted to, to put on the guitar, retaining that feel and looking nice, you know. And the paint's intact too, there's no... Paint's yeah. intact, yeah, exactly. And I, I don't think you can take this paint off. It's, it's, I've tried and it's quite hard to take <laughs> off. Um, and that's it, as you said, it's, it's the bound uh, body, neck, headstock, block inlays. It's, uh, it's pretty simple, but it's, you know, it's uh, And the, the neck, I re even though I'm a lefty, I've played this upside down, the, the neck profile is really nice. It's a yeah. thin C, right? It was based on, um, it is a thin C. It was based on either an old V that I had or an old Les Paul that I had. I can't remember exactly which one it was, but I like the feel of it. Um, it's, not as, it's not as narrow as a traditional V-neck. Um, it's just got a bit more meat to it without being yep. a baseball bat, you know. Um, so it's perfect. I, I use them every night. I use them, you know, more, well, at the same amount as, if not more than, the original V. Um, so it's a workhorse. It sounds great. It's tuning's great. And it looks fantastic. I love the way it looks. So I love the way that even though it's floided, so it's locked at the nuts, you've got some real, you've got the Grover tuners on, which gives you stability as well. Exactly like that. Stringing and stuff. It's I mean, it's a combination of everything that over the years, I mean, we all like speed knobs, Grovers, Floyds, EMG, they're, they're things yeah. that we all sort of gravitate towards because they do a job, not because someone else has got them necessarily. Right. But um, they, they yeah, work. Like you said, know. it's a workhorse. Now, what made you not have a tone control just because you never use them or do you think it, it gives you more if you don't have one? I use them very rarely. Right. Um, very rarely. And I, it was just taking up too much real estate on the guitar. I didn't need it so much with Priest. It's pretty much full on all the way and, yeah. and off you go. You yeah, know. off to the races, yeah. Yeah, so I took out the, I took out the it originally came with three uh, volume, uh, is it volume tone and tone or volume volume tone? I can't I remember. I think it was VVT, I think. Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah. So I took them out, wired that up, and, uh, and that's it really. So it, it's on. But the, the, again, the pickups, you know, you can have it on 10, you can right. wind them back a little bit and they, they, they still clean up nicely. You yeah, I was that. hearing you doing that before we started mm. filming and it, it responds nicely like a, like a PAF, what a concept. It does, and I think yeah. that's the beauty of these. I mean, you know, they, they, they clean up nicely, they, they break up nicely. If you put it on about five or six or seven, you take some of that high gain off. But yeah, it, you it's know what I mean? still got some grip. Yeah. yeah. Whoops. As you can hear. Yes, yeah. indeed. <laughs> So, uh, so that's about it, really. That's the, that's the signature, and they did a great job. I remember the first prototype came through the post, and I was just elated at how much guitar it was. You know what I mean? It was. Gotcha. You know what I mean? So, so yeah, that's it. And uh, I play does it, every it night. Does it freak you out a little bit that this is actually a signature guitar that's yours? It does, really. I mean, it's one of those things that, um, as I said, I created over years, which a, a company like Epiphone think that people will like. You know, and you know, we, we've put it out there and people are, you, you know, when you see things turn up on Instagram, or right. they're playing their one, they've got it, they love it, and you know, it's, yeah. it's a really humbling thing. And my first proper guitar, you know, I had a few guitars back in the day which were kind of, um, you know, like Woolworths, you know, we used to have in the UK, <laughs> yeah, I, don't know what, yeah. I don't know what the equivalent is. Like Sears, of, I guess, ladies Sears. and gentlemen, yeah. So you'd go into those sort of department stores and you'd get like a cheap copy of something. So I used to play those, but my first real guitar I got that my, my father got me was an Epiphone Flying V, and it had it had the uh, the it had like a Ep uh, Explorer headstock and it had like a perloid white um, oh, okay. finish. But it was a, it was an Epiphone V, so it's always been part of yeah, part of your so it's, it's, yeah, yeah. it's just the cycle of life almost literally. Exactly that, yeah. So, the cycle of Epiphone yeah. or something. So now we're going to the rig. We got thrown off the stage because this band called Saxon, who were really, really good, are sound checking right now. So we've got footage of this, but let's talk about your signal chain. So we go from this fine guitar. Your picks are very thick, by the way. Tell us about those very quickly, because that's a bit integral part of the plan, and also the strings as well, because you play pretty heavy strings. Yeah, these are 11 to 50 uh, on here. We're, we're half a step down. We're in E flat tuning. Um, it's manly strings, ladies and gentlemen. Manly, manly strings. strings. I'm holding on to my manlyhood as <laughs> much as I can. Thick strings, thick picks, you know. But uh, I've always played uh, thick strings, you know, as I said, when I was growing up in bars and stuff, I always played 11 to 50s or 11 to 48s, I think right. they were, um, in standard, in concert pitch. I tried the 12s in E flat and they were just a bit 
yeah. a bit too much work, you know. So it's a bit of a it's a it's a it's a happy medium. We're in half a step down. I've still got the 11 to 50s, uh, and the picks are two mil. These are these are in tune. Yeah, those are dangerous. If you hit someone, if you flick one of those in the crowd, you're going to take someone's eye out. It's friend. it's true, you know. Um, a few <laughs> people have complained that I've hit them squarely in the chest, you know, but uh, they shouldn't have been sitting down. No, but uh, <laughs> but. Um, the great thing about Intune is they, they can print whatever you want on the picks. Right. So I, I have, you know, I'm a Star Wars fan, so I print this run, uh, it's Star Wars ship. So it's the X-Wing fighter, the next one's going to be the TIE fighter in Europe, and then it's going to be the Millennium Falcon in maybe Japan if we go there. Uh, you know, and stuff like that. The last tour was Bounty Hunters that uh, oh, right. okay. Darth Vader employed to catch Han Solo. So it was Boba Fett, it was Zuckus, it was Forlom, whatever. So it's just creating that, you know, fans like that sort of stuff. They like to collect stuff. And these are actually licensed by a Lucasfilm, so I can't get sell out. them. Really? Yeah, yeah. yeah. We, oh, we got so you permission. have to get the license. So it's, this is official. This yeah, is yeah. not. This is not a bootleg Star Wars thing. No, we had to get permission from them, and they were all too happy. They, there's conditions. I can't, you know, I can't sell them, for example. Right. But that makes them even more exclusive, and I think that's that's cool. That's part of the fun. You know wow, what I mean? Wow. Fans get them, and you see sets of the the last set turn up on eBay. People have traded for the whole set, set, and they've got the whole set, and they're selling. It's it's. That's, quite fun, you know. It's like the, yeah, wow, wow. You know. So they're, they're like trading cards almost. Yes. Yeah. Trading picks. And as, as I said, it's all for... <laughs> they need some better grip on them. That's, that's <laughs> just my cack handedness But um, again, it's, it's not, you know, you're not making money out of the picks. You're creating something that's more about the fun of it, the collecting right. of it, the fun and the, the trading. And as you said, you know, so uh, that's what they are. So let's talk about the pedals in your rack drawer. They're obviously controlled by the ground control in looping. They are. So the, the setup is, is heads and pedals as yes. opposed to rack effects. You as know. you said, not cheating. Not cheating you, at all. You, you I'm know. not implying anything to anything <laughs> else, but it's amps and it's pedals. Um, again, I've always grown up with amps and pedals, so I kept it right. that way. Uh, they all go through a loop switcher, Yep. which just makes it easier to control on stage. They're all off stage and the loop switches on, on, the, on the front. I, I think that's a, the Voodoo Labs Yeah, controller. Voodoo Labs ground control, yeah. yeah. And the only things I've got out the front is a, is a, um, a Jerry Cantrell wire and a uh, rotor vibe, yeah. Um, and you've also, got a, you've also got a rack mount wah, which and you've got the remote controller out by the stage. That's true, yeah. At the front of the lip of the stage, so you can hit people with picks really easily, right? Exactly, yeah. And it, it, you know, it's one of those things where I'm always at the front of the stage, you know, interacting with fans, and it, right. it was just a pain to get back to the wah all the time. Right. So to have one there made complete sense, you know. And gotcha. I think you can have up to five controllers, so I'm yeah, working on that. Yeah, you should. You know what I mean? Have one on Scott's drum riser. Exactly. There That's a good go. idea. But, um, and as far as all the other effects are concerned, I don't usually have a lot of effects. I've got chorus, uh, wah, as I said, and a the, delay. And you've got a mini phaser as well. Well, that's where the fun comes in. Yeah, so the so fundamental it's... sound is the chorus, delay, and, and the distortion comes from the amp, the clean sound comes from the amp. Um, now for this tour, I'm having a ton of fun with effects for minute passages, time, right? but they're yeah, yeah, really yeah. important, you know, like, so there's a, for Turbo Lover, there's a, you know, the, the Phase 90. Uh, You've got the mini one, haven't it's you? It's the mini one, it's not the big one, it's the one, it's a single knob, it's based on the, the old one that yeah. uh, Eddie used to have, it's yeah. just a one, one knob, and the same thing with, the, it's an MXR chorus, so it's a micro chorus, right. uh, one knob again, it changes slightly the voicing, so, uh, you know, at this position, it's this type of chorus, and then the further around you go, it's not necessarily faster or more depth, it's a different type of chorus. Gotcha, you know? cool. So I've always used that. Um, and then there's a, I've got an MXR uh, carbon copy delay, uh, which at the moment has been... Um, yeah, you've got the Ogre. The Ogre. Chronomaster. It is, I mean... Uh, For the Star Wars thing, right? Exactly, anything sci-fi, anything, you know, fun. Me and uh, A.D. Vines, my tech, we were out in Japan again and we went into this guitar store and they had these, these pedals. And I, I told you before, whatever it did, I was going to buy this thing because it had a, you know, it, it looked like a, like a robot alien space head type thing and you could lift up its mask and there was the knobs underneath. Right. Luckily, it turned out to be a delay pedal. Yeah. So I put that in there and it's been there ever since, really. Um, and you've got a DD, Boss DD7 in there as well for a longer delay, I guess? Boss DD7, yeah. So the main, the main delay that I use uh, is the Ogre. And then for Saints in Hell, there's this part in the middle which has got a very strong right. repeat. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And we actually put that through the front. We put that through the front because it is so strong oh, right. on the record. Oh, right, okay, gotcha. Um, and that's literally kicked in for about 30, 40 seconds and then it's out. There's a POG uh, micro, no, it's a micro POG. Yeah. Which does the whole um, octave up, yeah. octave down thing. 
I'll use that in Sinner with just the octave down. So I'll play the, the part higher. Right. On the record, it's like a double part. So yeah. it's a higher one and a lower one. So that comes in there. You've um, also got, a, you've got the RT20 rotary ensemble, haven't you? The RT20, boss, yeah. it's the boss one. I was what's looking that used for? I, at the beginning of Sinner. Oh, yeah. At the beginning of Sinner, uh, KK had this uh, kind of rotary effect. And I've always been looking for that that kind of effect. Hendrix had it on House Burning Down. Right. You get a lot of rotary effects that sound like, I don't know, they just don't have that quality. And this one did. This one had that sort of Hendrixy uh, sound that we just use in the beginning of the Sinner. So Plus it's got that cool light thing on the front. It's pretty. It's yeah, like yeah. A it disco. looks cool. Yeah. <laughs> Again, sci-fi. It's, yeah. it's like, yeah. a, like a, uh, a brown 80s Porsche color, which is always cool yeah. as well. And then you've got the, the thing that swirls around. Yeah. It looks cool. Um, Again, just for that section in Sinner, and then it's out. So fundamentally, the sound is pretty easy, as I said, with the, the chorus and the delay and the, the amp giving the sound. Yep. But this tour, the set list kind of requires that there's all this fun stuff going on. So there's the Phase 90, there's the rotaries, there's the pogs, there's all that sort yep. of fun stuff. And it's, it's great fun to, to use. And as you said, it's just for maybe three or four bars, and then it's out again. But it make, they're, they're the yep. things that make things special, I think. Yeah. These little colors you throw in here and there. You know, and then you go back to the meat and potatoes of the, of the regular sound. So. Yeah, less is more, allegedly. Definitely, well, definitely. In, in truth, in that case. Well, yeah, exactly. As I said, so it's just fun to experiment with those sort of things. I'd never really experimented that much before. I never had the, the reason to. Right. Uh, but this set list is pretty diverse and, you know, over, you know, from 1974 up to Firepower today, yeah. there's a lot of stuff going in there which we can have a lot of fun with, so. That's a, that's a big heritage right there. It is, it's a fun one as well, yeah. you know. Four decades plus, wow. Almost, I think it's... Uh, 50 next year, isn't it? 50 next year. Of the, you know, I think uh, the actual incarnation of the band Judas Priest was 69. Wow. So next 50 year it's 50 years. So we've got, to, we've got to get an anniversary going of some sort, you know. Yeah. So that'd be fun. Um, but yeah, again, from the first record was 74 up until 2018. The great thing is those songs stand up with new ones and vice versa, the yeah. new ones stand up with the classics. And no, I was looking at the same, the, the set list is very eclectic in terms of it's not time period based, it's because no. they all fit together. They do. Regardless. It's their character, I mean, these guys have been doing it for, as we said, almost 50 years. Yeah. Scott's been in the band almost 30 years. Wow. So there's a, there's a character in the band that's unmistakable. So whether it's from 78 or from, you know, 88, you know who it is. It yeah. could be a different sound, different style, but you know it's Priest. So, yeah. uh, so the set list works really well together. Yeah, musical DNA remains intact. Without a doubt, yeah. Richie, thank you. It's a pleasure, Nick.